All right. So, just a little bit of show and tell here. Uh, I started building a gingery lathe. Built a bunch of patterns and made quite a few castings. In fact, uh, Tom Lipton, uh, back when he was doing the Roach Coaches, uh, he uh, did a little bit of machining and setting up some datum surfaces on uh, some of the parts for me. Uh, Probably, I mean, you know, if you follow the book, uh, you can get pretty far with a file and, you know, the top of an accurate, you know, table saw or, you know, I was using a joiner bed, which was, uh, in fact, that bed's supposed to be accurate to within a thousandth uh, across the surface and it's uh, about four feet long or so. Anyway, off the point. Um, one of the guys that works in the maintenance department, he used to work for uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab. And I was told him I'd trying to find some scrapers and he one day he called me over and he said hey here and he handed me this package of uh, scrapers well he doesn't work at the lab anymore and uh, certainly he's not doing any bearing scraping but he gave me these this one here I didn't even ask but I'm pretty sure he made this one by hand or you know homemade uh, it's got a turned handle this thing is really heavy but this is a pull type and I, he's got a it's like a brazed carbide cutter on here I gotta imagine he was using this to get into the corners to make relieves or something like that for uh, between flat surfaces or something like that. It's a pretty acute cutter. Uh, maybe you could even get into the, the corner of a dovetail and uh, make relief space in there. And we got this one here. This is an Anderson Brothers. I don't see a model number on here, but I'm sure. Well, it doesn't matter, I guess. I mean, uh, this is probably, I want to say, the springiest of the lot. Kind of a little bit thinner than this other one. This other one here, I imagine he must have used this one the most because he's, he's got the most padding wrapped around it. Uh, this is like paper tape, you know. Anyway, these all got carbide inserts, or excuse me, carbide scrapers on them. Actually, that one's got pretty decent spring to it, too. Uh, this one here is a Sandvik. And, uh, yeah, that's his name, Herzaga. Anyway, that one looks like it's maybe just a, unless that's solid carbide. Boy, that's a highly polished piece of metal right there. Anyway, that could just be a piece of high speed steel. Look at that. And then here's a whole. Big pile, there's a oh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven new blades in here. Or, you know, may not be new, but carbide blades, uh, different profiles. That one doesn't look like it's carbide. Yeah, maybe not all of them are. But at any rate, so he gave me all of these here. And, uh, you know, it's been over a year ago, and I, I, I haven't used them yet. Uh, I kind of I ended up falling into the Atlas lathe, and uh, I didn't didn't have the need to continue on with the the gingery lathe. Um, these here, you know, when I first got these, I had no idea what they were. But you know, if you know it's a tool, before you throw it away, you better hang on to it and find out, right? So I, I had these for six or seven years before I figured out what they are. But these are scrapers for Babbitt bearings so if you're doing a uh, you know where a shaft goes through something and it's poor Babbitt this is a tool you go in there they're, they haven't been sharpened well maybe back in antiquity they were sharp this one's actually really dull eh, it's un unnamed but just the way this blade is made I think this is probably a professionally made tool um, but anyway but that's how you get in there and you you scrape away just a little bit of that babbit and you keep checking the fit until it fits. Here's another one. You, know, you can see there's different profiles here. And this one's stamped with something in there. I was trying to read it a minute ago. I can't quite read it. B. Looks like Carmichael. Yeah. B. Period Carmichael. So maybe that's the manufacturer. 
I don't even remember where I got these now. I've had them so long. This one looks like it must have gotten rusty. It's all pitted. Um, but not so bad here on the inside. So somebody somebody gave it the wire wheel treatment, which, uh, you know, I mean, I guess it gets the rust off, but it, it, it really obliterates any kind of a patina that might be on there. I don't believe this is nearly as old as this one is. I mean, look at the handle on that. This is pretty clunky in comparison, you know. Whoever made that one cared a little bit more about the way it felt. Actually fits pretty well on your hand here. This one, yeah, you know, I mean it's it works. Anyway, I just thought you guys might be interested in that. Uh, oh, I forgot to bring it in here, but he also gave me a can of uh, red lead in a, a steel Kodak film container. Here, I'll cut away for a minute and I'll, uh, I'll get that. All right, here it is. Uh, you know, I've never even opened it. I realize that, but uh, let me tell you what: this little can, it's heavy. <laughs> That's probably a pound in there. Uh, but you know, this is kind of toxic stuff, and uh, you know, there's other ways of of uh, putting a color onto the metal. You know, you can buy a, oh, a high spot. I think is what they call it, or you know, there's different colors, but Prussian blue is sort of the, the classic one that you would use. But there's orange and red, and uh, you would use different colors for certain things. But anyway, but I just thought that this can was kind of neat. It's Eastman Kodak Company. Yeah, it just says it on there twice. Nothing else. Yeah. Anyway, but all this stuff, this worked over there in, in Livermore, California, where they where they build nuclear bombs, <laughs> or they may not build the bombs there, but they uh, they do research on nuclear testing. Anyway, kind of interesting history, I suppose, about this stuff. I should ask him what he did with all of it.